very much, Caroline. We actually do have this room till 6.30. Um, so although we want to proceed the questions soon, um, we're not in as dire a situation as it might seem. So um, I'd like to turn um, the podium over to Jean-Francois Van <clears throat> Good evening, and thank you very much also to Jeff and Mary for uh, organizing this uh, conference and this roundtable. I'm uh, very flattered. Uh, in fact, when I received the email inviting me to come here about a year ago, um, I was very excited and very flattered, and I immediately said yes. <laughs> um, I must say, I was also a little bit surprised because I thought there must be a, a lot of historians who are for, far more senior than I am that could probably do a much better job than I can uh, at this presentation. And it's only when I uh, started to fully realize uh, what I've been asked to do, which was to squeeze the entire uh, history, environmental history of France and the uh, French colonies uh, in the, and the Ancien Regime um, in 20 minutes, that I understood that uh, what must have happened, you know, I thought I'd only been invited because everyone else had been wise enough to find me. Okay. <laughs> so what, what did uh, Jeff and Mary ask me to do? They asked me to offer reflections on the way in which work in environmental history alters standard narratives of the French past. They also asked me to provide a big picture kind of history that looked not only at France, but also at the French colonies in the early modern era. It will, of course, be impossible to go beyond uh, simply scratch, scratching the surface of the subject, and I won't attempt here to discuss the numerous um, works on the topic, so it would be far less uh, historiographical than what Karin just um, uh, did now. But I will try to stick to the required specifications for the talk and suggest a few ideas to try and convince you of the interest of taking environmental history seriously. First, I thought it was maybe interesting to um, define what is environmental history because it might not be obvious to everybody in this room. It's the history of the interrelationship uh, between humans and their surroundings, studying both how humans have transformed the environment and how the environment has shaped human history. There are other definitions, uh, but uh, for the sake of clarity, this is the one I'm going to use for, for this talk. Environmental, environmental history as a self-conscious new field of research was born in the United States in the late 1960s, but became established in France much later. And you know, there's some debate about whether uh, it's, I think it's still very marginal, uh, and Karen uh, might disagree with me, but um, early modern French and French colonial environmental historians are even fewer in numbers. There have been a number of earlier works uh, that could potentially qualify, at least partially, as environmental histories, and a growing number of self-conscious environmental historians working on the Ancien Régime, or the French colonies, during the early modern era. Yet, what characterizes most of these studies is their limited geographical or chronological scope. No synthetic environmental history of France or its colonies, similar to those of, say, Britain or the United States, exists. <coughs> This is a pity because environmental history is often strongest, I believe, when it operates at the macro rather than at the micro level. The second limitation of existing studies is that they concentrate mostly on either anthropogenic transformation of the environment or ideas about nature rather than on how environmental factors have shaped human history. This is an especially regrettable omission for the early modern period as changes to the environment in Europe were comparatively less important at the time than after humans gained the power to radically transform the environment through the harnessing of fossil fuels. In the early modern era, humans were less able to deflect environmental forces, and the role played by these forces was more important than modern historians are likely to acknowledge. So in the next few minutes, I would like to look at two examples of where a global environmental approach can shed new light on France's history and offer two propositions. First, that the importance of the Colombian exchange for France and its colonies should be reassessed. Second, that the relative significance of the French Revolution is likely to fail globally and that, the other, and that other natural factors, such as fluctuation of the climate or the importance of the energy revolution of the 18th century, will be reassessed in the future. First, the Colombian exchange, uh, a phrase first coined by Alfred Crosby in 1972 to designate the widespread exchange of plants, 
animals, diseases, and people between the old and the new world after Christopher Columbus, has recently been labeled as the greatest event in history since the end of the dinosaurs. <laughs> but the Colombian exchange remains relatively underrated by non-environmental historians. The major impact in France was demographic. Fernand Brodel noticed how maize, imported from the Americas, saved the southwest of France from the famines and food shortages of the Baroque age. The potato played a similar role, though its cultivation became widespread in some regions of France only towards the end of the 18th century. Potato and maize were both exceptional plants that produced much higher yields per acre than any of the old world crops, such as wheat. They could also be grown on soils that were ill-suited for other purposes. The introduction of these American crops was part of large-scale agricultural changes that included the diffusion of clover, the draining of marshes, and increased irrigation, to name just a few. The Colombian exchange also had a powerful impact on the Americas in general, and on the French colonies in particular. To illustrate this impact, I'd like to take the emergence of slavery on the island of Saint-Domingue, today's Haiti, as an example. Saint-Domingue became a slave society, and not, like Canada, a society with slaves, in part for environmental reasons. And just to clarify, slavery scholars make a distinction between societies with slaves, where slavery exists, but where it is not the dominant labor system, and slave societies, where, soci where slavery as the dominant form of labor shapes everything, every other social relation in that society. Saint-Domingue's distinctive need for slaves emerged in part because of the, the of environmental constraints resulting from the Colombian exchange. Although part of this history is, has been known for some time, much new material has recently appeared, including not only new sources discovered and compiled by historians, but also advances in research in the natural sciences that gives a fuller picture of this process. Europeans chose to colonize the New World because they could not effectively establish plantation agriculture in West Africa due to Europeans' extreme susceptibility to tropical diseases. Would-be colonizers and the domestic animals were important allies in the process of ecological imperialism, another phrase coined by Alfred Crosby, experienced disastrous mortality rates. By contrast, the tropical zone of the Americas was healthier due to the initial absence of yellow fever and festiparium malaria, the most severe strain of malaria. And this is something that we only know uh, through genetic studies um, uh, in the last few years. This, this has been proven that uh, malaria and, and, yellow, uh, and yellow fever were not present in the Americas before Columbus. What is more, the drastic decrease in population of much of the American continent as a result of diseases spread by Europeans after the arrival of Columbus facilitated the occupation of the land. In contrast to Europeans, most Africans carry various sorts of resistances and immunities to malaria and yellow fever. For that reason, after the in accidental introduction of these two diseases in the West Indies at the beginning of the 17th century, French indentured servants started to die in droves and had to go through a long period of seasoning. African slaves, on the other hand, were much less likely to succumb to these diseases and it is no wonder they were widely considered to be better adapted to the hot climate. This explains in part why Saint-Domingue overwhelmingly became a slave society. African slaves, who were more disease resistant, became the laborers of choice. By contrast, the historical evolution of New France, roughly today's Quebec, was very different. It is interesting to observe that the Mason-Dixon line which symbolically marks the separation between slaveholding and non-slaveholding states in the US, coincides closely with the northern limits of falciparium malaria. It is not a coincidence that the two main French colonies of the early modern era, New France and, and Saint-Domingue, followed a similar trajectory to that of the 13 American colonies, depending on whether or not the region was plagued by falciparium malaria. There are other striking examples of the epidemiological dimension of colonial history. For instance, we now know that the arrival of large numbers of non-immune subjects to a place where yellow fever is endemic often triggers large-scale epidemics. This explains why Schweizer's attempt to colonize Guyana after the Seven Years' War, for example, failed so spectacularly. Nearly 10,000 settlers died 
and of what we can now identify as yellow fever. This also illuminates the larger context of what happened to, in Saint-Domingue during the Haitian Revolution. In contrast to rebel slaves who were generally immune, yellow fever and malaria more than disseminated French troops sent by Napoleon to reconquer the colony in 1801. The Colombian exchange is linked to another important concept for understanding the history of Europe and France in particular, the concept of ghost acres. Ghost acres, uh, roughly speaking, measure the land that would be needed to supply food, fuel, or other materials produced in the colonies of a given country. Ghost acres and coal are keys to understanding how Western Europe was able to continue economic and demographic growth after the end of the 18th century. Colonies freed land because forestry and agriculture in the Americas and ocean fishing and whaling provided goods that would have otherwise had to be produced in Europe. Timbers, furs, fish, and of course sugar, and other tropical products played an increasingly important role in the French economy and diet, especially during the 18th century. Without the extension of its ecological footprint, it is probable that France would have hit a wall or what economists call a Malthusian catastrophe. The transformation of the environment in the colonies as a result of the Colombian exchange was also substantial. For example, beaver hunting had a profound impact on aquatic ecosystems in Canada. Though little in the way of documentation has survived, these changes undermine much of the Indians' way of life and the manner in which they sustain themselves. Settlers had the most impact on the St. Lawrence River Valley. As a result of their attempts to reshape the American terrain, to resemble the countryside they had left behind in France, these newcomers created a new agrarian landscape. Typically, the history, the historiography of New France has focused on the reverse direction in this relationship. That is, on the ways that the environment and contact with wild American Indians helped shape society and the character and ways of life of the French settlers. The ability of the coureur de bois to roam freely in the vast uh, North American expanses are seen as a determining factor in shaping French Canadians' identity their so-called so love of liberty and the special care, for example, with which they treated their children. However, other historians disagree and insist on the continued links with France and the insistence with which Canadian settlers try to reconstruct the landscape and environment uh, similar to the one they knew in the, mother, in the motherland. French settlers also deeply altered the landscape and ecosystems of colonies in the West Indies by clearing large sections of the forest in saint domingue Guadeloupe, and Martinique in order to grow coffee, indigo, and above all, sugar. Activities which resulted in huge environmental changes. I would now like to turn my attention to the French Revolution. You all know the story of Zhu Enlai, forgive my pronunciation, uh, China's former <laughs> prime minister, who, when asked about the impact of the revolution in the early 1970s, famously answered that it was too early to tell. We now know that it was a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation. It was, in fact, um, referring not to the French Revolution, but to the 1978 student protests. However, this remark could more accurately be applied to another process that overlapped chronologically with the French Revolution. I mean, the Industrial Revolution. Indeed, the full environmental impact of the Industrial Revolution has only begun to be fully understood. Though it's too early to know the full consequences, industrialization marks the beginning of the Anthropocene, a new geological era in which humans have become a geological force greater than natural forces. It is no wonder that most environmental historians place the divide between early modern and modern history not at the French Revolution, but at the Industrial Revolution. As a consequence, the importance of the Industrial Revolution is constantly re-evaluated upwards, and the significance of the French Revolution increasingly pales in comparison. In fact, I wonder to what extent the French Revolution was not itself also, in part, a byproduct of a third revolution that unfolded in Britain in the 18th century, what we can uh, call now the Energy Revolution. It is possible that France was unable to address problems that the British were able to solve with new fossil fuels and technology. I have not much evidence to offer, but I would like to speak with here about some possible connections. The changes introduced by fossil fuels were huge. Britain managed to break through the ceiling imposed by environmental limits and constraints 
at the end of the 18th century through harnessing fossil fuels and exploiting the benefits of the ghost acres discussed before. By contrast, China lagged behind and went through a century or two of turmoil. I wonder if the same thing might not explain, at least in part, what happened to France, which missed the, tra which missed the train of the first energy and industrial revolution for various reasons, and unlike Britain, liked easily accessible coal deposits. The rise of industry in the British Isles negatively impacted France. For example, competition for mechanized mills in Lancashire increased urban unemployment in France, especially following the Commercial Treaty of 1786 between the two nations. The situation fueled discontent and was reflected in the Cahier de Doléances. A more general rivalry with Britain certainly played an indirect role too. The decision to side with the Americans during the War of Independence, which further drained the French state coffers and ultimately compelled Louis XVI to convene the Estates General, is only one aspect of this competition. This antagonism was reinforced by the commercial success of Britain, success partially due to the nation's newly acquired coal-powered machinery. One could argue that malfusion pressures generated rival solutions in Britain and France, and perhaps in the French case, the solution was sending about two million red men abroad to eat and die in Italy, Germany, Russia, Spain, or Egypt, uh, and so on during the Revolution and Napoleonic Wars. More generally, the role of energy in France and other countries has been grossly neglected by historians. It is not a coincidence that the apex of many societies coincided with their discovery of new sources of energy. The Dutch Golden Age coincided with the beginning of the widespread use of peat in that country. The ascendancy of Britain from the late 17th century onward also coincided with its increasing reliance on coal. Forests were of fundamental importance in the early modern age, the age of wood. Forests were the equivalent of oil today, providing timber for shipbuilding, fuel for heating homes, for making bricks and for iron smelting, and were also the primary source of construction and other raw material. Forests also had many other uses for peasants who would collect wood and let their animals graze. One basis for France's role as a great power of the 17th and 18th centuries was that it was richly endowed with comparatively large forests and good soils. But after the switch to fossil fuels, France, which had little coal, was at a disadvantage. This energy handicap continued to be detrimental to the country throughout the 19th and 20th century and can certainly explain at least in part why the uh, country largely lagged behind Britain, Germany and then the United States after the onset of the age of fossil fuels. I'd like, I would now like to discuss an environmental factor that has often been neglected as a trigger for the French Revolution, climate. The exceptional climate of 1787 and 88 certainly damaged the harvests in France. All of the bad harvests only caused a disease, dearth, in which, many, in which few perished, and it didn't cause a famine. It immediately triggered a, a number of food riots. From July 1788 onwards, a subsistence crisis unfolded, triggering constant agitation. On the 13th of July 1789, so on the eve of, the, of Bastille Day, two major food riots shook Paris. Uprisings of this nature continued on and off until October. Of course, the French Revolution has multiple well-known long-term causes, but the crisis of subsistence on the eve of the revolution threw a lot of people in the streets. There has been in recent years an increase in the number of studies on climate history. Scholars are slowly revisiting long 